Oh, I'd just like to start uh, by thanking Mohammed for, uh, for the opportunity to talk today. And what I'm going to tell you about is a, a, a story about two different strand exchange proteins and how their relationship is uh, altered for the purpose of meiotic recombination in, in budding yeast. And I'm going to start by acknowledging the people that did this work, that all of the in vivo experiments and the cell biology that I'll talk about including the EM, was done by Veronica Cloud, who's a graduate student in the lab. And the biochemistry is done by a particularly talented research associate who just joined my lab a couple years ago um, and has uh, been on fire and making my life really wonderful <laughs> since she showed up, and that's Ling Chan. Okay. Um, Brian uh, Bradkey and Jennifer Grubb have also helped out with some of the experiments and reagents that, uh, that we used for biochemistry were provided by Wolf Heyer and Patrick Sung. So the proteins that I'm going to tell you about today are relatives of E. coli recae that are the central proteins in homologous recombination. They're DMC1, which is a meiosis-specific protein, only functions in meiotic recombination, and RAD51, which is essential both for mitotic recombination and for meiotic recombination. They have very, very similar biochemical activities. That is, they form helical filaments on single-stranded DNA. Once they form these filaments, uh, those filaments are capable of searching for homologous sequences on another uh, DNA molecule and creating uh, D loops. And we've talked about those intermediates at the meeting several times. Now, many organisms have these two, this arrangement with the meiosis specific gene and the, and the mitotic gene, uh, budding fission yeast, plants, mice, and humans, but they, it's an ancient duplication that codes for these proteins, but they have been lost in a number of lineages, uh, most notably flies and worms. Um, and so, you know, Charles. Uh, uh, Dr. Charlesworth can now fall asleep and doesn't have to listen to the rest of this talk since, since it doesn't apply to, to, to flies. Okay. Um, the, the story sort of began with a, a discovery in the Shirlene Roeder's lab that RAD51 is actually, uh, there's an inhibitor that, that regulates RAD51's activity in meiosis, and that is in a DMC1 mutant where uh, recombination is blocked after double strand breaks form. Um, this inhibitor prevents RAD51 from undergoing recombination, so that if you get rid of HAD1, head, head you restore recombination, you get uh, efficient meiosis with only modest decreases in crossing over, okay? And this was shown uh, by the Sun Lab to result from direct binding of this HAD1 inhibitor to the RAD51 protein and preventing its function, okay? So now uh, what, what I wanted to do is sort of start with a little bit of review to tell you what we know about this uh, function from mutant analysis and from cell biology. First, with respect to cell biology, uh, RAD51, we sh I, I showed RAD51 can form immunostaining foci on spread chromosomes, uh, as can DMC1, and if you do a double stain, you get a, a, a largely co-localized pattern where the, the foci, this is a spread yeast nucleus at about three hours after induction of meiosis. It's probably the, uh, the zygotene stage of meiosis. Um, and you can see a lot of yellow here because they're co-localizing. Okay, um, which what, with th this and, and several other observations tell us that there is um, cooperative function for these two proteins. Um, RAD51 mutants um, uh, don't form any viable spores. They're very defective in a homologous recombination, and particularly defective in partner choice. So you, un you appreciate that at the stage when recombination is going on, there are four chromatids present, two pairs of sisters, and a double strand break can be healed either from uh, sequences on the sister, which is almost exclusively what happens mitotically, or um, what has to happen in order for proper meiotic recombination is there have to be recombination between homologous chromatids so that you can have uh, uh, rearrangement of, of, of uh, alleles and so forth for diversity and also so you can have tension on the M1 spindle to, to allow reductional segregation. But a RAD51 mutant shows a defect in partner choice and I'll show you that in a, a little bit later how you assay for that. Uh, if you look at a DMC1 mutant, you have an absolute block to recombination. You have no repair of double strand breaks at all. Um, and you have a uh, very uniform meiotic arrest, but if you now take away head one, you, you have a partner choice defect again, but actually the, you have a very high spore viability, relatively high spore viability, and you can have up to um, almost normal levels of crossing over, okay? So uh, from this, we really understand that, that these two proteins are somehow cooperating for the normal uh, partner choice function. 
And they also, uh, the results with head one lead us to two kinds of models for what's going on. The model favored by the Rotor Lab at the time when this work was, the, the head one work was published is that head one repression is a transient phenomenon that's there to provide time for DMC1 to join into the complex and help out. Um, they, they really uh, felt that RAD51 was likely to be the main driver of the enzymology and DMC1 a kind of a regulatory feature. Um, and the other hypothesis, which I favored for egotistical reasons, having discovered DMC1, um, is that uh, head one repression is permanent and, and then uh, DMC1 is doing all of the, uh, the enzymology with RAD51 somehow serving as an accessory factor. And so what I want to tell you is, uh, it, you know, to my great satisfaction, I think we've proven the second model so I can, my ego is intact, at least for the moment. Okay, so to, the way that we went about this was to take advantage of what was known about the structure and function of these proteins, particularly from the solution of a crystal structure of RecA protein with DNA, which is from the Pavlotich lab. And that really sh helped illustrate one of the key properties of this protein in the helical filament is that it contains two different DNA binding sites, a high affinity site, which binds so that the filament can form and present the sequence that's searching to the DNA that's being searched. That binds very tightly, and this, this structure showed a quite amazing thing, which is the high affinity site is composed of two loops which are disordered without the DNA that are shown here in yellow and green, and they form like lobster pinchers around the DNA, separating the DNA out into base triplets. So actually, the, search, the searching entity is three nucleotides at a time, separated by these spacers. And these binding sites are spatially distinct from what had been identified uh, by Shikbata's group as a, a lower affinity DNA binding site composed uh, in, in their work, that they identified two positively charged residues. We actually, when we looked at this in the crystal structure, realized the patch consisted of three positively charged residues. And one could align this with the crystal structure of RAD51 and find that although those residues aren't conserved in the primary sequence, there's none the, nonetheless uh, a patch that appears in the same space, three-dimensional space uh, as, as did this patch of positive residues in Rec A. So we mutated these three residues to alanine to remove these positive charges. Now the, the idea is that the positive charges are required to align the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA that's being searched. And by removing them surgically without disrupting site one, you could still form filaments but have no enzymatic activity. That was the idea. So just to show that that's true, that this is now uh, Ling and Brian's work. Brian did uh, fluorescence anisotropy, which is basically a way of measuring DNA binding by how mobile the DNA is when it's bound up with protein. Um, it's a, a physical assay. He didn't detect any difference in the affinity caused by this mutation. Um, Ling, when she did electrophoretic mobility shift experiments, uh, was able to see a little bit of a difference in, in the binding, uh, a, a somewhat uh, less pronounced mobility shift in the mutant than in the wild type. But if you uh, just look at uh, the measure of affinity by how much uh, the species here is shifted, very similar binding affinity. Veronica did um, electron microscopy, where you can see these helical uh, features of the filaments here with the wild type protein. And she found that the, the filaments that form have the same pitch. Um, the same average length and the same width. One difference she, we noticed is the, the wild type protein is more likely to form branched proteins, branched filaments rather, than the mutant is, and we think that's probably because of secondary site binding that, that's defective in the mutant. And she has other evidence but that the secondary binding site is in fact defective. Now the way we look at the function of the protein, the homology search strand exchange function is Another biochemical assay where you take an oligonucleotide that's been labeled with radioactivity, you coat that with the protein that you're studying to make a filament, and then you present it with a plasmid that contains a sequence that's the same as the oligonucleotide. And if it's a capable of searching and undergoing homology search and D-loop formation, then you can take the protein away and you'll be left with a joint molecule like this where the plasmid is now radioactively labeled. And you can see that this is the free oligo here, and this is the D-loop here that's formed uh, by RAD51. Um, it turns out RAD51 doesn't have activity in this assay unless you add a cofactor, which is RAD52. What you can see, RAD52 also has a little bit of activity in this assay, but here's the normal amount of D-loop activity that one can see for this protein. 
And if we look at our 2,3A mutant, uh, you can see that it's defective. It doesn't have activity. Um, this is also uh, true if you use a different system where you stimulate with a different cofactor, also no, essentially no residual activity. This is just background level. Um, I, and I have to sort of point out that this, this is a project that's gone very, very smoothly from start to finish right up until we got reviews back. And we had a reviewer, two reviews, we liked it, and then the, the ubiquitous ub reviewer three. And reviewer three said he didn't believe this data because we probably didn't know how to subtract background to be able to tell the difference between wild type and mutant. And, in, and even after we said, yes, we do know how to subtract background, they actually said, I'm not convinced on a second round and the paper was rejected based on things like that. We appealed <laughs> and it was okay in the end, but I, it was one of the more astonishing things I've ever had dealt with at a journal, so I, I have to complain about it. Okay, so now we're switching to in vivo. We have a mutant that makes, binds DNA, but, but can't undergo D-loop formation. Um, and so we want to know if that's also true in, in vivo. So this is an immunostaining experiment where we're looking at foci, now RAD51 foci, and you can see that the, that forms foci just fine. Um, and so that fo foci, are, we know, are, are form at sites of double-strand breaks at the tracks that are formed after double-strand breaks form. You, you need to make breaks in order to get these structures. Um, and so that's a, this is an assay that's for in vivo binding. We can also look at function. Um, I don't know what happened here. This didn't notice this before. It seems to be a Microsoft problem. But um, this is a kill curve with radiation. Um, and basically, RAD51 stands for radiation resistance. It was identified initially because uh, it makes yeast very sensitive to ionizing radiation because ionizing radiation creates double strand breaks and uh, the recombination pathway fixes them. So wild type yeast cells are very resistant. Null mutant for RAD51, very sensitive. And here's our 2,3A mutant. It's basically indistinguishable from the null, so it, it's not capable of repairing mitotic double strand breaks. So that's consistent with the D loop assay where it had no residual activity. Now, what about meiosis? So, the real experiment, what we wanted to ask was you know, is RAD51 contributing? strand exchange activity in meiosis. And so here's just genetic mapping data, just classic tetrad analysis and map distances comparing wild type with a mutant to 3A. And we, this is nine different intervals and uh, actually originally forgot to put the labels on here and it doesn't really matter. Okay, there's no phenotype. The only phenotypes that we can detect turn out to be slight reduction in spore viability and about a one hour delay to the time to M1. Another way to look at this is to look at partner choice. I told you at the beginning RAD51 is required for choosing a homologue rather than the sister, and this is the assay when, that one uses to study that. Uh, we, we have a restriction site heterologies flanking a recombination hotspot shown here, and so on one pair, one homologue, we have the restriction sites close together, and the other homologue, they're farther apart. Okay, when you, when you cleave this DNA, you purify the DNA from meiotic cells, you cleave it and run it on a gel, and um, recombination intermediates that join two chromatids together as a result of repairing double strand breaks, or this double strand break repair intermediate, um, you get double holiday junction intermediates where two DNAs are, are branched and, and connected. So if you join two sisters from this short restriction fragment, you get a smaller intermediate from the other one, a large one, and then the interhomologue joint molecule runs in between. It's a 2D gel system that helps resolve uh, the branch species. And so you can actually see it e most easily in the mutants here where you see this pattern of three spots. And these are the three double holiday junction spots, the two inner sisters, the big one and the little one, and the inner homologue species in the middle. Wild type cells makes o make o almost exclusively interhomologue intermediates. The null mutant has more intersister than interhomologue. There's a very strong defect. The 2,3A mutant looks like wild type. No, no problem. Now, to contrast that with DMC1, I'm not showing you all the data here. We made the, the equivalent mutant. These sites, the site 2 is conserved in these proteins, make the exact same mutant in DMC1. All the biochemistry has been done it's essentially the same. There's a, a site 2 mutant that functions in vitro like a site 2 mutant. There, here's the DMC1 null where you don't see any joint molecules. Here's the 2,3A mutant, no, no joint molecules. So that says it's the DMC1 strand exchange activity that's important, not RAD51s. 
Now this is a result that uh, a little bit old, but is important in this context, which is that I had shown previously that in a RAD51 mutant, DMC1 foci don't form normally. They're relatively faintly staining. Okay, and this isn't because of some antibody issue. Um, the, these foci are, uh, there's simply less DMC1 signal in a RAD51 mutant than there is in wild type. However, again, in the 23A mutant, DMC1 forms foci of normal staining intensity. So that's starting to give us a hint about how 51 is influencing DMC1. So this, these features um, led us to try to, to understand if it, how RAD51 uh, is influencing DMC1 in, in, in more detail. We started with a, a protein, this is the last thing that I'm, I'm introducing. There's a, a My5SA3 is a heterodimeric protein that's a, a previously characterized DMC1 accessory factor specific to DMC1. So the mutants phenocopy a DMC1 null mutant. If you don't have either of these proteins, DMC1 can't form foci. They, under somewhat abnormal biochemical conditions, you can see this heterodimeric protein stimulate DMC1. And also RAD51 is known to be required for MI5SA3 to form foci. Okay, so these features together really helped us to sort of get the idea that somehow RAD51 was functioning with MI5SA3 to, to um, influence DMC1. So Ling has been able to reconstitute this type of activity. So now this is again a D-loop assay, but now we're looking at DMC1's D-loop activity rather than RAD51's, which I showed you before. And what, what I wanted to point out is that RAD51 under these conditions without its own stimulatory factors does not have D-loop activity, okay? Essentially al almost background levels of activity here. Similarly, DMC1, this is in the presence of magnesium, which is the sort of normal condition that you would expect in the cell. The DMC1 uh, D-loop activity is actually quite weak, okay? If you throw in My5SA3 in the presence of magnesium, it actually doesn't stimulate DMC1 very much at all, right? It's basically, it actually inhibits it a little bit. But if you now throw in 51, you get a 25-fold stimulation in this assay, okay? That's also true if you purify the rad 5123 a mutant and look at it, it this, this is a, a mutant that I showed you has no D-loop activity of its, of its own, but it can stimulate very well in addition. So what this is telling us is that rad 51 is serving as a DMC1 uh, accessory factor, okay? Um, if there are biochemists here, you can look at this later and see if you like my conditions. I have a feeling that's not as important to this audience as it is to some. Okay, so what have I told you? RAD51 does not contribute to strand exchange, uh, strand uh, searching and, and strand invasion activity during meiotic recombination. DMC1 is the only strand invasion activity in budding yeast. Uh, uh, RAD51's function is to direct DMC1 strand activity to a donor sequence on a homolog rather than a sister. It functions along with my 5 say 3 as an accessory factor to stimulate the, uh, DMC1's D-loop activity. So this means that like REC-A protein, RAD51 is a multifunctional protein. It does, uh, does functions in the cell other than homology search and strand exchange. And um, I didn't ha really have, wanna go into it, but um, it, we think that probably RAD51 does contribute uh, a backup function to clean up uh, residual breaks in the event that the DMC1 pathway, uh, the, either DMC1 fails to load or, uh, you know, for a very small fraction of the breaks and that would account for the reduced spore viability, but it, it's not playing the major role in meiosis. So I'll stop there and take questions.